So today's lecture from Dr. Austin was on the thyroid and parathyroid glands, um, as well as blood supply for head and neck. So first thing she shows you here is the infected thyroglossal duct cyst. Um, so the thyroglossal duct is a remnant um, from how the thyroid tissue moved from its origin at the foramen cecum, which is at the base of the tongue, down the midline of the neck um, for the tissue to then wrap around uh, the trachea. Did she happen to tell you about like the path and talk to you about the different clinical correlations of like a thyroglossal duct that does not go away? Anybody? I thought it just closes on its own when you get older. That's the only thing she talked about? Really? She told a story about a student that she had that kept, that had theirs still open. Okay. But That's beyond it. that, that was it. Okay. Well, yes. So, so your thyroid tissue, it originates at the base of the tongue at a spot called the foramen cecum. And I said this before, but whenever you hear the word foramen, think whole. So the thyroid tissue starts there and then it goes through the foramen cecum and descends down the midline of the throat via the thyroglossal duct to finally sit around your trachea. So since you have this pathway, like this embryological pathway for that tissue to travel and then rest where it's normally located in most people, that means that whenever you, like whenever you have movement of something, you can then have a pathology where that movement doesn't occur correctly or the pathway that it takes doesn't go away. And so that's what happens with a thyroglossal duct cyst, like the thyroglossal duct didn't go away. And so then it can turn into like a fluid filled cavity. Um, and like it says here, it can be anywhere from the base of the tongue, because at the base of the tongue is that form and cecum, all the way down to the thyroid gland itself. The majority of them are at the level of the thyrohyoid membrane under the deep cervical fascia. Um, it's usually midline because that duct is midline um, versus uh, your pharyngeal arches are on the sides. So pharyngeal arch, so they're called branchial cysts when they're pharyngeal arches, but since I don't think she talked about pharyngeal arches in this lecture. I'm just gonna let that go. Um, and the biggest thing is in questions, if you think it's a thyroglossal duct cyst, um, you'll have your patient swallow and it'll move up and down when the patient swallows because your thyroid um, cartilage actually moves up and down when you swallow. So that's a way to test for that as opposed to if it's on the side of the neck and the patient swallows and it doesn't move, that tells you it's not a thyroglossal duct cyst, that's like a branchial cyst from your um, pharyngeal pouches and arches. All right, so here's one picture where you can see the thyroid gland in relation to other structures in the area. Um, there's another one. Here where you can see it a little bit better without like other stuff around it. So you can see how your thyroid gland is this butterfly-shaped gland that's wrapping around your tracheal rings. And here's your thyroid cartilage, which is sitting just uh, superior to it. So here's, what your here's where your thyroid gland sits. Um, so, it's deep to your infrahyoid muscles because you can see here, here are your strap muscles that we learned about before. Um, it's anterior to um, your cervical vertebra five to thoracic vertebra one. So C5, C6, C7, and T1. Um, it has those two lobes and in the middle, it's joined by the isthmus. Um, it is anterior lateral and anterior and lateral to your larynx and your trachea. And so remember your larynx is going to be um, above your vocal cords versus your trachea is going to be like below your vocal cords. Um, it is enclosed within a fibrous capsule, loose sheath, pros versus cons, I don't know what you mean by that. Um, and it is highly vascularized, which we're going to see later on. 
So thyroid cartilage, cricoid cartilage, first tracheal ring, and then you see your thyroid. All right, so here's another picture of your thyroid just showing you in relation to uh, the cartilage skeleton in your neck. You can see how in this picture, they've done this axial slice through the area and you can see how the trachea is, excuse me, the thyroid gland is surrounding the trachea as well as the esophagus. And then they've also pointed out some parathyroid glands on the posterior aspect of the thyroid. Um, let's see, what else is important here? Oh, so going back to the fascia that we talked about before. Um, so your pretracheal fascia is going to surround your thyroid gland as well as the front of your trachea. And you can see here this prevertebral fascia, which is in front of the vertebral bodies. And then in between the two would be your retropharyngeal space. And again, here's your carotid sheath that gets um, contributions from your pretracheal, your, excuse me, your prevertebral, your pretracheal, and your investing layer of fascia. So because your thyroid tissue migrates from that form and cecum at the base of your tongue down the thyroglossal duct to rest around the trachea, and some people, not all of that tissue migrates down fully, um, it's about a third of patients have what's called the pyramidal lobe, which is just you know a remnant of the fact that the tissue travels down the thyroglossal duct and then settles. So for these people, just some of their tissue didn't make it all the way down. Um, but it's still like connected, it's still functional, it's still glandular tissue. It's just a, shaped a little bit differently. Um, and they also point out here how you can have accessory thyroid gland tissue. So in some patients, especially during adolescence, what can end up happening is that not all of their thyroid tissue moved down the thyroglossal duct, or what can happen is that none of it moved down the thyroglossal duct and it stayed at the foramen cecum. And usually for these patients, you'll learn about this um, or you'll discover this during puberty because during puberty, you get a ramp up of production of thyroid hormone. Um, and so the gland ends up swelling and looking at the patient, they'll say like, you'll look and be like, there's something at the back of their tongue. Um, and that's what's called a lingual thyroid. For these patients, you wanna see if there's thyroid tissue anywhere else in the body, because if there's not, um, as long as that thyroid, that lingual thyroid is not giving them any problems, you leave it alone, um, because it might be the only thyroid tissue that they have. And if you take it away, you automatically um, make them have hypothyroidism because you need, you need thyroid hormone. Um, so you'd have, like, if you mistakenly did that, they, they would have to have thyroid hormone supplements for the rest of their life. Um, so you wanna check like for those patients. So that's what's called a lingual thyroid when that thyroid tissue um, stayed at the base of the tongue and didn't move down the midline to settle around the trachea. So your thyroid gland is your largest endocrine gland. It produces thyroid hormone which helps to control your metabolism. Um, and it also produces calcitonin, which helps with the calcium um, balance in your blood. So calcitonin and parathyroid hormone, which comes from the parathyroid gland, um, those two hormones actually balance each other because calcitonin tells calcium to go into your bones versus parathyroid hormone tells your bones to release calcium into the blood. So it's the balance of those two hormones that help keep the calcium balance in your blood. And remember, we need calcium for contraction of all of the muscles in our body, both smooth muscle and skeletal muscle. So it's really important that we have like that right balance, that maintenance of calcium homeostasis in our blood. Um, and it is highly vascularized, which we're gonna go over the vasculature momentarily. Um, so this is the anterior view of your thyroid gland. So your left lobe, your right lobe, your isthmus versus on the posterior view of your thyroid gland, you can see the parathyroid glands here. Now these are just the four most common places where you find the parathyroid glands, but they can actually end up at different places too, because like the thyroid gland, your parathyroid glands actually migrate down to settle where they end up being. 
and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a bit. Okay, so when it comes to the arterial blood supply for your thyroid gland, um, first you're gonna see here, we have um, our, so there's the arch of the aorta and then from the arch of the aorta, you have the brachiocephalic trunk and this is on the right side. Um, the brachiocephalic trunk splits into the right common carotid artery as well as the right subclavian artery. From the right subclavian artery, one of the branches off of that artery is the thyrocervical trunk. From the thyrocervical trunk, one of the branches off of that is your inferior thyroid artery. So this is one of the arteries that's giving blood supply to the thyroid. So subclavian, thyrocervical trunk, inferior thyroid artery. From your common carotid, your common carotid splits into the internal carotid and the external carotid arteries. The internal carotid artery is gonna go up to give help supply blood to the brain versus the external carotid artery has eight branches that you're gonna end up memorizing. One of those branches is your superior thyroid artery. So see how you have an inferior thyroid artery and a superior thyroid artery. Thankfully, those are you know, nice and simply named telling us via their names what they are supplying. Okay, so this is putting into words like what I just talked about, so I'll reiterate it. So your superior thyroid artery is the first branch of your external carotid artery. It descends down to give blood supply to the thyroid gland. It pierces the pretracheal layer of the deep cervical fascia, which remember that is surrounding um, the thyroid gland as well as the trachea. It divides into anterior and posterior branches and supplies the anterior superior aspect of the thyroid gland. So you can see here's your superior thyroid artery branching off of um, external carotid artery. And then here's your anterior and posterior branches supplying the superior portion of the gland. The inferior thyroid artery is the largest branch off of your thyrocervical trunk. And remember your thyrocervical trunk branches off of that first part of your subclavian artery. The inferior thyroid artery runs superomedially, so up and towards the middle, um, and is posterior to the carotid sheath. Um, and it supplies the posterior and inferior aspect of the gland. So subclavian, thyrocervical trunk, inferior thyroid artery. And showing two in this picture, your parathyroid glands and how their blood supply is mostly coming from the inferior thyroid artery as well. And then she makes a note here that these two arteries um, have extensive anastomosis. Okay. So your thyroidema artery, this is a, a question that goes back to the fact that vasculature can be variable from person to person. So about 10% of patients have the thyroidema artery. It's a small unpaired artery that in this picture, you can see it ar arising from your brachiocephalic trunk, but it can arise also from the arch of the aorta, which would be like down here, from your right common carotid, so it would be like more up here from your subclavian, which would be over here, um, or your internal thoracic artery, which your internal thoracic artery is a branch off of your subclavian. Um, it ascends on the, on the anterior surface of the trachea, which you can see in this picture here, and giving off small branches to the trachea and supplies the isthmus of the thyroid gland. The reason why we wanna know about this particular artery and how it exists in 10% of patients is that in the event of a neck surgery, um, the surgeon has to be super careful not to nick this artery. So this is your arteriary aorta, meaning your heart is right down here. And your left ventricle has just pumped blood out of the heart into the aorta. So blood is at its highest pressure in this area. And so since you have this single unpaired small artery, if a surgeon should nick this artery or mistakenly cut it, um, the patient could actually bleed out on the table because there is blood at such high pressure that 
like the blood would just come like squirting out. That's what ends up happening when you cut an artery is that the high pressure makes the blood like squirt out of the body as opposed to if you cut a vein, it oozes out. Um, so yeah, this can be super like dangerous and especially I believe in questions when I recall having to answer them, they talked about the surgeon like nicking it and then because it was under high pressure it ended up like shriveling back into the neck and they, it was hard for them to find the source of the artery to stop the bleeding. Um, but yeah, that was one of those, like, this is one of the random facts because it is in 10% of patients that you need to know. Um, but again, in this picture, you can also see the other major blood supply to your thyroid gland. So again, here's your inferior thyroid artery coming off of your thyroid cervical trunk, which is a branch off of your subclavian. And here is your superior thyroid artery coming off of your external carotid artery. Okay, so thyroid veins form a plexus. So a plexus is just a network of um, blood vessels. Uh, you have different venous plexi, plexi, I think is the, is the plural because it's Latin, but you have different plexi or plexuses, however you want to say it, um, all over your body. Uh, so you can see how it sort of forms a web of different veins that are taking away that deoxygenated blood from the thyroid gland. So your three important veins that help to form this plexus is your superior thyroid vein, your middle thyroid vein, and your inferior thyroid vein. So your superior thyroid vein accompanies the superior thyroid artery and drains um, into the internal jugular vein, which you can see right here. Here's your IJV. So this is, so the superior thyroid vein and the superior thyroid artery running together have similar names. This is an example of like that fact. However, your middle thyroid vein actually runs with your inferior thyroid artery. So this is an example of breaking that general rule of vasculature running together, having the same name. Um, your middle thyroid vein, just like your superior thyroid vein, um, drains also into the IJV. And so your superior thyroid vein is draining the superior pole of your thyroid gland versus your middle thyroid vein is draining the middle portion of your thyroid gland. Now, your inferior thyroid vein is independent. Um, and they are draining the inferior poles um, of the thyroid itself, and then they drain into your brachiocephalic veins. So looking at this picture, they point out like, here's the superior pole of the gland, here's the inferior pole of the gland, here's your, where's the superior? your superior thyroid vein running with the superior thyroid artery, and then here's the middle thyroid vein draining into your IJV, and then your inferior thyroid vein, here we go, your inferior thyroid veins draining down into your brachiocephalic vein, which would be down here. Um, looking at this photo, I'm sure it, it varies for people, but it looks like the superior thyroid vein and the middle one are connected. So does it kind of, do they kind of drain into each other a bit? So they would have branches that connect but they're gonna, it's still gonna be considered like middle thyroid vein and a superior thyroid vein draining into the IJV. When you see plexus, think of different small branches connecting together. Cause that's what's trying to make with that point that they form a plexus. Cause if you look technically superior is connecting to inferior as well. And then inferior over here is connecting to superior. So, oh, okay. so they're all connected to each other. Correct, yeah. So that's like what particular spots where they'll all drain differently. Exactly. They're, so when they talk about the draining, that's like the biggest portion of the vein draining into the larger vein. So it's trying to show you here that like middle draining into the IJV. I don't know why they cut off superior draining into IJV, but down here you can see inferior going to drain into brachiocephalic. So even though they're all connected, it's going to be like those larger parts portions of the vein connecting into the main like venous branch that's going to like get the blood back to the heart. Does that make sense? It does. Great. Okay. 
So this is a better picture. Um, so here again, here's our superior thyroid vein and our superior thyroid artery running together. Here's our middle thyroid vein, and then here's our inferior thyroid vein. And you can see a little bit better here how they're like basically like trying to show you that they're all connected together as a plexus in this like web of vessels. But the major drainage that's happening, you have superior thyroid vein draining into your IJV, middle thyroid vein draining into your IJV, and then your inferior thyroid veins draining into your brachiocephalic veins here and here. And you see the matchup of superior with superior and then middle vein with inferior artery and then inferior veins by themselves. Okay. Um, let's see, what would be important about this picture? So again, we're seeing the vasculature again with superior artery and vein, and you can see inferior vein as well. Um, also in this picture, you can see um, the different branches of vagus nerve and how they're relating with the muscles in this area. So vagus nerve is running down here along with the IJV and the common carotid in your carotid sheath. And it's gonna go down and then a branch is going to come off hook under either the arch of the aorta or the brachiocephalic artery, and then come back up as your recurrent laryngeal nerve. So here's your left recurrent laryngeal. And then they're not really showing the right because this is just the vagus, but there's a left and a right recurrent laryngeal. It would be like deep to here. They gotta come up and innervate muscles in this area. Um, mostly the muscles that have to do with phonation. So uh, manipulation of your vocal cords in order for you to speak. Um, what else would be important about this picture? So I don't think she, she hasn't gone to the larynx yet, so I'm gonna leave that alone. Okay. And again, you can see this really well in this picture, your superior thyroid artery and your superior thyroid vein running together, and then your inferior thyroid vein below. And then again, here's your parathyroid glands on the posterior aspect of your thyroid with the inferior thyroid artery giving blood supply to those parathyroid glands as well as the lower portion of your thyroid gland. Mm, what else? So, yeah, I'm, I'm hesitant to say any of this other stuff because I want I want to make sure I don't go too deep in the head and neck because there's a lot of stuff you can like you can talk about the nerves running alongside the esophagus. You could talk about the sympathetic trunk, but I don't know if she's going to harp on that with y'all. So I'm just going to keep going because she didn't really- I remember it. saying that the superior thyroid ar artery splits into like an external and an internal one. It does. And what like- the internal supply? So the internal is supplying your larynx, like inside of your larynx. So you can and see- thyroid? Huh? And then the external is just the thyroid? Um, I think so. Cause like you can see, so here's superior thyroid artery. And then, yeah, so for internal, let me see if, I think it was better here. You can see how, so like internal, is it internal or superior laryngeal? Well, actually no, superior laryngeal is its own branch that goes to supply the larynx versus external internal. So was she talking about arteries or was she talking about nerves? Um, in my, oh wait, yeah, never mind. you're right. She's talking about the nerves. Yes, because like the internal branch of superior laryngeal is gonna go and do um, innervation inside of the larynx versus external branch of superior laryngeal comes down and um, innervates your cricothyroid muscles. And in fact, like your cricothyroid muscles are the only muscles um, of phonation that are not innervated by recurrent laryngeal. So okay. external, external branch of superior laryngeal nerve for innervation of cricothyroid, internal branch goes inside and does sensation. And then recurrent laryngeal actually goes inside and does all the rest of the muscles in there. And there's a bunch of muscles in there. 
So I'm gonna hold off on talking about the muscles. So the nerve will split and the artery won't. Correct, at least not internal and external. Um, you can see how, um, back up again. You can see how you have a superior laryngeal artery that's going in and following um, the, go, go, go way back. That's following um, the internal branch of superior laryngeal nerve. So again, superior laryngeal with superior laryngeal versus for um, the blood supply, I think they just talk about it being the superior thyroid artery. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, da, 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 da. 35 year old woman was diagnosed with an adenoma of the thyroid gland. It requires excision of the lower pole of the gland and ligation of the artery supplying that region, which of the following nerves accompanying the artery is most likely to be damaged if the surgeon is not careful. So recurrent laryngeal nerve is almost always the answer when it comes to this area. Um, and then you can see here is your left recurrent laryngeal. So vagus nerve came down here and then recurrent laryngeal branched off, scooped up and then came back up so it could then go into the larynx um, and innervate all the muscles in there that are gonna manipulate the vocal cords. But here is your recurrent laryngeal nerve. And then here is your inferior thyroid artery. So you can see how they're like right next to each other. And pretty much when it comes to like damaging a nerve in the neck after surgery, then answer is almost always recurrent laryngeal. Okay. So your parathyroid gland. So you've got superior and inferior parathyroid glands, and they're on the posterior aspect of your thyroid. Um, the superior parathyroids lie at the middle of the posterior border of the lobe of the thyroid gland within the capsule of the thyroid gland. Okay. Inferior is more variable. All right. So I mentioned before how the parathyroids can end up in different places. Here we go. So I got this out of more. And because the parathyroids move down just like the thyroid glands, that means that they have the chance to move to the wrong spot. So you can see how the most common location for like your parathyroids, they have like the highest number. But then they give you these other like percentages of locations of where the parathyroids can be. So like one could just not come down and end up closer to where like the hyoid bone is, or one can go way, way, way down too far and end up on like the arch of the aorta. Um, because your parathyroid glands, when they move, and it's the, um, so it's the two inferior glands that move with the thymus. And the thymus is a uh, tissue that actually ends up settling on top of your heart. So that's how these parathyroids can end up so far down is because they were riding with the thymus and they didn't hop off soon enough. Um, versus your superior parathyroids, they're, they actually move down on their own because they're much closer. Like your, like your pouch, your pharyngeal pouches are basically like on the sides over here. So when it comes down, the thymus goes like this versus, so the thymus and your inferior parathyroids go like this versus your superior is like much closer to where the thyroid is. So it's just like a little bit down, um, but that's like more embryo stuff. And I don't think she asks you many embryo questions, um, but yeah, so um, I'm sorry. go ahead. Uh, will you be posting this PowerPoint or send it to our um, president yes. to post in the live? Yes, yes. I'm only using like a couple of slides off of a reference, but yeah, I'll definitely send it with the video for today. Thank you. No problem. And like I said, this is in your more book, but I found it and I was like, oh, this is a good picture. Okay. Um, where were we? Okay. Um, so the glands themselves are pretty tiny, six by four by two millimeters. Each only weighs about 50 milligrams. Um, and I mentioned before how their arterial supply is mainly from your inferior thyroid arteries and the anastomosis between superior and inferior thyroid arteries. Mm 
Is there a question? Okay. Um, so your parathyroid, oh. hold on just a second. I just dropped my mouse. Mm -hmm. An 80 year old male presents to the emergency department due to a cough shot. Uh, somebody's unmuted, FYI. Okay, so your parathyroid glands produce parathyroid hormone. Um, and I mentioned before how parathyroid hormone and calcitonin, um, by balancing each other, help to regulate uh, calcium in the blood. Uh, the glands themselves are small, flat ovals, external to the thyroid capsule, inside the sheath, question mark? I thought they were inside of the, okay. Did she answer this question in class? I don't remember her doing so. Okay. Can you repeat? So, Sorry. she has inside the sheath, question mark, question mark, question mark. I'm just... Does, is she trying to say it? they are, or is she like trying to ask y'all with this? Do you remember it from class is what I'm asking? Oh, no, me either. Okay, I'm just gonna skip over that part. Um, so your superior parathyroid, so you have two superior, oh, where's the superior on the side? I guess maybe that one, um, and two inferior parathyroids. So your superior parathyroids are superior to your inferior thyroid artery versus your two inferior parathyroids are inferior to the inferior thyroid artery. Um, most four, four plus two. I don't know what she means by this. She's talking about the amount of parathyroid glands people have. So she's saying that some people have more than four? Yeah. yeah. But she, they have to have at least two or more than one. Mm. Or they'll die. Yeah, to have enough parathyroid hormone to balance the calcitonin. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so jumping off of that, when a person is having thyroid surgery, um, say they have hyperthyroidism, so like their thyroid gland is making too much hormone, and that has its own set of signs and symptoms that we won't go into today. Um, one of the possible surgeries that a person can have is to have their thyroid removed. Now, when they do that, the surgeon has to make sure they locate the parathyroid glands and then saves them, because obviously if you take the parathyroid glands out, you can kill your patient. Um, so yeah, that's why she was mentioning how you have to have at least two because you actually do need your parathyroids so you to live. You take out a thyroid and they'll be okay, but you can't take out the parathyroid. Correct, because we can give them um, thyroid hormone supplementation versus for parathyroid, um, like because it does calcium balance, I, I guess we just never came up with the parathyroid hormone to give folks. And to be fair, it would be hard to do it because like, calcitonin and PTH are constantly being made to keep the calcium levels in balance. So yeah, but I'm sure somebody's probably working on it right now. <sighs> but yeah, it's much easier to just give them thyroid hormone, especially because you need it for metabolism. So it isn't, there isn't anything that's counterbalancing the thyroid hormone. Um, it's just, Here's the level that you need. Let's try and keep you at that level. Um, so yeah. Um, so she does make the point that the two superior parathyroids are more constant in their location, which I mentioned before, because they move the shortest amount of distance to get to where they're supposed to be located versus your inferiors, because they move far, farther, they are more variable where they end up um, and they can actually be in your mediastinum. And we already talked about the inferior thyroid artery as their arterial blood supply. And then she mentions here how there are parathyroid veins that are gonna drain into that thyroid plexus of veins. Oh, and hey, you can see on that picture where I was talking about before. So vagus nerve coming down, but then recurrent laryngeal branching off and scooping under. And 
So vagus nerve coming down, but recurrent laryngeal branch scooping off and coming back up. That's a good picture for that. And then this is just, again, another slide showing you the different places where your parathyroids can end up. And here again, like I mentioned how the thymus, how the inferior parathyroids hitch a ride with the thymus. So if they don't hop off where they're supposed to, they can end up just following the thymus all the way down into the mediastinum and settling on top of the heart with it. In adults, most, like most adult thymuses, it's just fatty tissue because your T cells have already matured and then moved on. But in kids, they can still have like a big active thymus with those T cells maturing. Okay. Exploration of the tracheoesophageal groove at the level of the thyroid gland would reveal what important structure bilaterally. Again, in most instances, the recurrent laryngeal nerve is your answer. Any manipulation of the superior thyroid artery must be undertaken with care not to damage its small companion nerve, V. Um, so we saw that in that picture, the external branch of superior laryngeal. And let me show it to you again. <clears throat> so here's external laryngeal, but let's find one where you can see the blood and the nerve together. Here we go. External, external laryngeal, and here's your superior thyroid artery. So just seeing those two run together. Do, do, does that come from the vagus nerve too, or other yeah. nerves? It does come from vagus nerve, yes. Vagus nerve does a lot. <laughs> so yes, external branch of superior laryngeal is a branch of the vagus nerve. Okay, which of the following is true of the inferior thyroid arteries? Um, so we see the answer is D. They often supply all four parathyroid glands. Um, A is wrong because your inferior thyroid artery doesn't come from your external carotids. Recall your inferior thyroid artery comes off of your thyrocervical trunk, which is a branch off of your subclavian artery. They cross over the superior cervical sympathetic ganglion. Um, actually, I think it's middle. Because I, I recall seeing something that was labeled middle cervical ganglion. Yeah, here's your middle cervical ganglion and here's your inferior thyroid artery. So actually it looks like well, from this picture, it looks like your middle cervical ganglion crosses over your inferior thyroid. But just remember, in case you decide to throw it in a question, your inferior thyroid artery is in close proximity to your middle cervical ganglion, not your superior cervical ganglion. I think your superior cervical ganglion is like much higher up. Um, and then what was the other one that was wrong? Um, they supply most of the anterior surface of the thyroid gland. No, the anterior surface of the thyroid gland is mostly supplied by superior thyroid artery. Inferior is doing posterior and the lower part of the thyroid gland. Because remember that inferior thyroid artery is the main blood supply to your parathyroid glands, which is on the back side of the thyroid. Okay. Woohoo, external carotid and it's eight branches. Okay. So, let me go back. So I think I have that in this. Uh, I have a question, real quick. Uh, okay, go ahead with the question. Um, did you say that for the last question we were working on? Did you say that they uh, arise from the internal, not external carotid arteries? I, uh, I missed that part. Which one? Hold on. Uh, the, the question, which of the following is true of the inferior thyroid arteries? Mm -hmm. they the arise, so they arise from your thyrocervical trunk. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cervical trunk. Yes, it's your okay, superior you. thyroid artery that arises from your external carotid. Your inferior oh, okay. thyrocervical trunk. Yep. Okay, thank you. No problem. Was there another question? Nope. 
Okay. Uh, so, branches of your external carotid artery. Oh, no, wrong side down. Wrong side down. So, I like this knitter plate because you can see the different branches of your external carotid coming off. Um, so, these are the eight branches. And some people use a mnemonic to try and remember this. Um, I didn't, I just literally drew it on my neck and it kind of worked for me. Um, so I would like draw it with my finger on my neck. Um, but let's just walk through like all of the branches cause you're gonna have to learn them. At least I remember having to memorize them. So you see here, here is that superior thyroid artery that we talked about. That's the first branch, see it here. And then the next branch is your ascending pharyngeal. And it's harder to see because it's coming off of the posterior, as ex posterior aspect of your external carotid. But that's your second branch is your ascending pharyngeal. Literally, it's going up to give blood supply to the pharynx. So ascending pharyngeal. Next, we have our lingual and our facial arteries. So lingual meaning tongue. So this is like going below the tongue. So within the actual um like oral cavity area versus facial is going, is more external. So blood supply to like the face, so lingual and facial. Then going up, 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 up. We can see here is our occipital or is that posterior auricular? Hold on, here's occipital, that's posterior auricular. So posterior auricular, literally this is the opening for your ear. So behind the ear, posterior auricular. And then occipital going to this occipital bone of the skull. And then the two terminal branches of your external carotid artery, which you do need to know these, is, oh, excuse me, your two terminal branches are your maxillary artery here and your superficial temporal artery here. So this is like the temporal bone, which is another part of your skull. And this muscle here is actually called your temporalis muscle, muscle literally the muscle that's laid over top of your temporal bone. Um, and it's one of the muscles of mastication. Yeah. So your two terminal branches of your external carotid artery are your maxillary artery and your superficial temporal artery. Another thing that helped me when I was learning these arteries is that they paired really well. So like superior thyroid and ascending pharyngeal right beside each other. Um, lingual and facial. Lingual's going inside or lingual's going deep, facial's going superficial. Uh, posterior auricular and occipital, well, they're both going towards like the backside of uh, the head. So posterior auricular behind the ear, occipital going towards the occipital bone. And then our two terminal branches, maxillary, superficial temporal. So that helps me chunk the information too. That can help you possibly. Okay. So you can I have a question. Sorry. Um, do you know how we can get like quizzed over this? Because I'm like, I'm just kind of curious. Just like remember each branch. Yeah, it's stuff like um, so just knowing your two terminal branches knowing that um, your superior thyroid comes off of your external carotid versus your inferior thyroid comes off the thyrocervical trunk, knowing that facial artery is gonna supply to like more superficial than lingual being deep, it's stuff like that. Um, and it'll just like, it'll come up in different ways. So one of the questions that came up that I can recall was that there was a, consular branch off of facial artery or something like that. It's just, they just pop up in questions. I don't even know how to explain it. Um, but knowing that they all come from the external carotid can be important, especially because the internal carotid just goes directly up into the brain. So yeah, that's a long-winded way of saying, I don't know, <laughs> but definitely make sure you know your two terminal branches because that can just be a rote memorization question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm, yes, so here's our external carotid, excuse me, here's our common carotid branching into internal and external carotid arteries. And then again, here's our superior thyroid, our ascending pharyngeal, our lingual and our facial arteries, our posterior auricular, 
uh, where, where did occipital go? Here's occipital artery, and then maxillary and superficial temporal artery. Okay, when it comes to the venous blood supply of the neck, um, so we have our internal and our external jugular vein. Let's talk about the external jugular vein first. So obviously, because it's named external, it's gonna be more superficial. And you can see how here's our sternocleidomastoid muscle and the external jugular vein is superficial to that muscle. Uh, the external jugular vein begins just behind the angle of the jaw, which is right here. And it's formed via the union of your posterior auricular vein, which you can see your posterior auricular vein here. Once again, posterior auricular vein, posterior auricular means behind the ear. Um, with the posterior division of the retromandibular vein. So here's your retromandibular vein. So retromandibular behind the mandible. And it splits into anterior branch and posterior branch. So posterior branch of your retromandibular, retromandibular vein joins with your posterior auricular vein to form your external, external jugular vein. Posterior auricular vein, posterior division of your retromandibular vein, external jugular vein. And then again, another picture showing you the same thing. Posterior auricular vein, posterior division of your retromandibular vein, external jugular vein. When it comes to your internal jugular vein, that's draining um, the venous blood supply from the brain. Um, and it is the joining of your internal jugular vein with your subclavian vein that forms your brachiocephalic vein. You can see here how your external jugular vein actually drains into your subclavian vein. And then here's your IJV draining into your brachiocephalic, excuse me, joining with your subclavian main vein to create your brachiocephalic vein. And so you can just see, this is a good picture just showing you like the anatomy of the thyroid gland. Here's our pyramidal lobe, the different blood supply to the gland, um, and then the big vessels in the area along with your vagus with recurrent laryngeal branching off. All that in one picture. Oh, okay. Identify surface anatomy. So thyroid cartilage, angle of the mandible, sternocleidal mastoid muscle, clavicle, jugular notch. And that's all I got. Did she mention anything else in this area that you guys need to know? Maybe like your trapezius muscle? Did you say the jugular vein already? Um, no, I didn't. So this is probably your external jugular right here? Yeah. Okay, cool. What's the formal name for the Adam's apple? Thyroid cartilage. Okay. Okay, and then common carotid artery branching into your internal and external carotid arteries. Is that correct, by the way? Because this is just me like going off of how it looks on the body. So did she tell you this was common carotid and then internal and external carotid? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Yay, I do remember things from anatomy. Um, and then I believe this is your ansa cervicalis, correct? Correct. Yes. Awesome. Great. So memorize those pictures because they might come up on your desk. <laughs> All right. I have one question real quick. It's about the brachiocephalic vein. Okay, mm -hmm. so I know it's, is it the vein that has the brachial cephalic on both sides and the arteries only has it on the one side? Correct. Okay. That threw me off at first, but thank you. Damn it, I just dropped my mouse again. Crap, okay. Yes, I know that can be confusing, um, but that's one of the weird things about the vasculature um, when it comes to like upper limb versus head and neck, um, 
yeah, it's just one of those things. There's two brachiocephalic veins, but only one, one brachiocephalic artery. And technically, it's called the brachiocephalic trunk. Um, all right, folks, I will stop recording.